This is Aku Aku Transmissions, the first podcast entirely dedicated to Easter Island Rapa Nui. The name of this island is Rapa Nui. Uh, in the rest of the world, it's known as Easter Island, Isla de Pascua, Pash Island. But from now on, we'll call it Rapa Nui. So, I am Cristian Moreno Pacaretti, the first historian of this island, and only one so far. Not a big merit. There's only about 10,000 people on this island. And I'm uh, joined by our co-host, Esteban Manureva, the first linguist and only linguist of this island. Yeah, again, not a merit. Or maybe it is, I don't know. I'm not, not really, honest. not really. All right, what do you think, man? Hey, man. Well, uh, as you said before, it's not a big merit, I believe. There's only 10,000 people on this island, so it's not like there's many different... Uh, it's not like a popular subject to study. Now, um, what do we talk on a podcast about Easter Island? Well, right? we should Rapa Nui, Rapa well, Nui. well, I guess first of all, we should geographically uh, narrow people down where Easter Island is. South what Pacific, is latitude 2709 south, longitude 109 west. Uh, it's an island that's really, 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 really far away. It's not an archipelago, it's a single island. It's triangular in shape, it has three coasts. The north coast, the south coast, the west coast, no east coast. Well, just a tiny bit in the Poike Peninsula. Um, just um, 68 square miles, really small. And about 163.6 square kilometers. If you use the metric system, which is the right system, system right? Um, well, what else, right? We are on planet Earth, right? We are on planet Earth, but it really doesn't seem like it. Why doesn't seem like it? Because we're surrounded by almost a thousand statues. Wow. <laughs> a thousand statues, man. Almost. Almost. So that's what gave this island its renowned... Uh, it's reputation. Reputation, yeah. Statues. Gigantic statues. And how do we call them, the, those statues? Moai. M-O-A-I. Yeah, I've, I've had this, this thing like with, with most travelers. You know this island lives off tourism. Um, about 120,000 tourists come here to this island every year. For an island that has 10,000 people, it's huge. Huge, right? And, uh, well, the, the pronunciation for the statues, like when they say the Moa, or the Maui, Maui or oh, dude, the, that's a classic. The, yeah, man, what, what's that, right? It's Moai, Moai, it's really simple, Moai. Yeah, do, do not focus on the writing, the M-O-A-I, no, just focus on the pronunciation, it's Moai, Moai. It, we don't need, it's not so difficult if you try it. So I'm sure lots of you out there are trying it right now and practicing the pronunciation. Please do. And when you visit this island, you'll be loved by all your tour guides that you get here. Of course you will. And that's the primary idea of what we're doing this. Not necessarily for the tour guides, but as a general thing, the average knowledge of the island. Why? Because a lot of people might argue that this island is full of mysteries. Oh, statues everywhere. Oh, how did the people do it? Oh, it's such a small island. How can cavemen even do this thing? Yeah. These people killed each other all the time. Did we they? Did, not really. That's why we're doing this. To dispel all this... The myths. Myths of Easter Island. You probably you've seen a couple of documentaries. Maybe you sap it on your satellite television systems. Uh, National Geographic History Channel. Ancient no, please, civilization, man, man, History Channel, please, the, the, don't, don't. It's popular, man. It's popular. Don't it's go out there, there, man. It's out there. Well, anyway, you've seen in these major channels. Not really. I'm not displaying anyone in particular right now, but uh, you've seen a lot of stuff about the statues, about mysteries, about how can people do it, about the adventure of being in the middle of the South Pacific. But what's the reality behind this whole thing? What's the reality behind this gigantic statues? What's the reality behind this whole mystery thing? Well, reality is even more interesting. It's even more interesting than the fantasy. Uh, of course, uh, you start with the fantasy, but once you get um, uh, a grip 
on reality and you find out how interesting it is uh, there's no turning back uh, you don't need the fantasy anymore you don't need ancient aliens you don't need anymore the, the history channel crap that's uh, shown every day on or every other day on, on television you don't need all of those websites that are showing also the same kind of crap right the aliens and von Daniken and Thor Heyerdahl and all sorts of stuff yeah, well, you don't need that kind of stuff. So uh, we will, we are going to be covering this in our podcasts. It's going to be weekly podcast about the island, and uh, I'm sure we are going to. It's it's going to going to be mostly academic in terms of the sources that we are going to use, but we are going to try to make it fun. We're going to try to make it as interesting as possible. So, for example, you mentioned mysteries, uh, Esteban. What do you think yeah. are the, the, the mysteries of the Esteban? Well, there, I, the, the, give me one. There one are, mystery. There are two types of mysteries, for just to classify them before anything. Uh, popular mysteries and real mysteries of Esteban. Sure. Popular mysteries. Well, I guess the obvious answer are the statues, or how people got here, or how can be people able to build this stuff. Which, over time, you're gonna notice that it's actually very rational in its sense. But, I believe that, for the most part, the real, the reality of things is... Where are people from? That's one big mystery. Or is it a mystery? Well, technically... What does uh, science say about it? Well, science says that people, and, well, not only science, but most of everything claims it to be pollination in its na nature yeah so we have kind of three different sources about the to approach the past of the island the first source is oral tradition which is obvious right of course. oral tradition well when we talk about oral tradition what do you think uh, or what most people think well, are yeah, the the yeah. pros and the cons, cons. The pros and cons about that. Well, uh, the classic thing is that there's no way to 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 fundament it with facts, right? The, you're you're only relying on the on on the on the narrative quality of people, sure. right? No, and in Polynesia, especially, it's all about the narrative. It, it, it's not about the facts. Of it's course, about of narrative. Course, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. all it's more subjective, of course. In a sense. Now, uh, I, I believe that most people don't really understand what oral tradition really is. Like, well, for, for, for most of the part, I believe that most of the people, what, what do you do whenever you want to go, or an ordinary person, let's say myself, go and, and want to know about oral tradition? You tend to go to the oldest person in whatever community and just uh, ask him whatever question about his childhood, about his life and whatever, you know, he has, he's the person who holds the knowledge. biggest, the knowledge of the culture. Well, yes and no, really. That person is probably, okay, let's say I go to an 80 year old dude. That guy has mental lagoons, man. He's gonna give me an answer, but that doesn't mean he's gonna give me the right answer. For certain, every Polynesian is going to give you an answer. It's about. It's all about that, right? Yeah, Giving yeah, an that's, answer. That's the characteristical pattern in the Polynesian world, and that's why I believe people in this island are Polynesian. And I'm pretty sure because we are very good at narrative skills, man. <laughs> Only for that reason. You Only for that Polynesian. reason. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's enough for me, man. All right. But yeah, again, like. You tend to go to the oldest version of the community, and we tend to think that they're just stories, mythology, you know, like just. Uh, but the thing is, but but uh, kind of bring it, bringing it uh, down to earth. I I think oral tradition uh, about the pros of oral tradition is that the it comes from the culture itself. It it yeah. it, it, it if it's you are able, if if you have an analytical mind you can uh, make very good use of oral tradition you don't need to take it as a fact as a matter of fact but you can use it to understand the values of the culture you can use course, it to understand yeah. the uh, way of thinking of the people Absolutely. And, and, and what was more considered more worthy less worthy worthless of i don't course. know right people people we we the mythology does not concern itself with the reality, the objective reality of nature, not but it objects itself. Not necessarily. Not, yeah. But it mostly with the world of action, 
I mean to quote this from Jordan Peterson, word for action, a world for action, morality, ethics, social relationships. That's what mythology is all about. And sure. That's no different here on this island. So, uh, about the oral tradition, do you see any cons? Right, Be because those are the, the the pros are basically it comes well, from the culture. I, oh, this, oh, I, I, the, the, the cons is the, the the malleability of oral tradition. I sure. Think. The the ability of people, the malleability. The, <laughs> and this is really funny because I believe the it's a double it's a double, double edged, edged sword. sword. The ability to be a very good narrator is a double edged sword. Sure. Why? Because you tend to put your own perspective, and how heavily you do it, it depends on the person in the personality of the person that you're talking to. So yeah, I think that's on the bad side of oral tradition is that very it's very malleable. Like every single person has its own oral tradition. You can even concentrate it in different families. You could you could talk about the same thing, but people different families will tackle it in a different way because they have a different oral tradition. And there's this other thing about oral tradition that uh, I heard from an archaeologist. I'm not sure if I should mention him, but he's well very well renowned he has written several books and he told me about um, his experience in Samoa when they went there and they saw a bunch of stones and they thought it was an archaeological feature so they asked their Samoan guide to tell them the um, the story of those rocks over there Samoan guy uh, will was kind of caught by surprise but they said he said all right I'll, I'm gonna tell you the story But it's a long one. All right, they said. And the guy kind of um, placed some logs and made a fire and said, okay, we have a fire here. Don't worry, it's, it's getting dark. It's sunset already. So I'm going to tell you the story. And the guy started telling a story that was so engaging, so compelling. So this archaeologist and his companion and a few others were kind of Wow, this is really amazing, and the uh, the story continued for an hour, two hours, man. The fire, they had to put more wood into the fire because it was already <laughs> so uh, embers everywhere, yeah. right? And it was so intense, and the guy was like, a, "Wow, how do you know this? How how where did you learn the story and, and, and of this these rocks? It, it's just rocks there, and so on." And he said, "Well, I just made up this story." And it was like a, what? Yeah, I just made it up because you asked me to tell you a story about those rocks, so I just made it up, right? And that shows the amazing storytelling abilities that Polynesians have still today. And these are the abilities that Polynesian storytellers had since back then when the oral traditions that we have now Um, were created, were generated. Oh yeah, definitely. obviously these yeah. oral traditions have lasted for generations because they were the best among the best, and among all the storytelling and all the traditions that Polynesians had back then, these are the ones that have survived till today. Right? Oh yeah, definitely. It's 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 basically well, like a Star Wars thing that, that you know, it's like telling a Star Wars story uh, for the younger generations. Right? Definitely, but uh, and the good the good side on it is that you can among all these stories you can have a contextual knowledge of where the moral compass of people go to. Uh, like exactly. you can you can you can take a meta reality of it according to what or all the the, the the relatable points of all these stories going to right. So I. People you tend to, to, to not think about oral tradition in a sense of a reliable source of information, but it pretty much depends on the question that you're really asking. Are you asking scientifically, as, uh, an objective scientific uh, like, like question, or, or are, you just, are you trying to develop an idea of how the social structure of the Rapa Nui people was? Or are you trying to develop an idea of what the, the social relationships of people were? And the only way you can do it is through oral tradition. Sure. You're not gonna find that in archaeological records. You're not gonna find that in a fucking rock. Yeah. <laughs> so, so well, uh, going to the second uh, source of knowledge about the past of the island, we have this uh, historical records, right? And historical records have obviously this uh, ridiculous thing that historical records start only uh, when it comes to Rapa Nui, when it comes to Easter Island, Rapa Nui. 
They only start in 1722. Oh, yeah. Yeah. With the arrival of the first Europeans, because there's no written records from before 1722. Yeah, that's the first record ever written about the island. So, what are the pros and cons of historical records compared to the pros and cons well, of oral tradition? Well, the majority of part is the contextual knowledge of these people, the span of time that they stayed, the 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 previous knowledge that they had, and essentially just, I guess, their own perspectives. You know, these people were biased, and these people weren't really scientists. They weren't really looking for for what we're looking in today. They just arrived here by, you know. Chance. Try, chance random chance random chance or not even random chance they probably they were look but not for the reasons that we are asking today so I think that's the biggest concern it's not like these people were PhDs you know like all the Europeans all the Europeans that went on boats are all the Europeans that the rest of the European community didn't want on land so they, they just <laughs> sent them on ships you know that's all of them all of them well that's how Australia started yeah <laughs> But but a guy like James Cook or a guy like La yeah, but, but, they were clearly. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, you know what King, uh, the the, this guy, the uh, French King Louis XVI, when he was about to be beheaded, he was asking about uh, La Perouse. So uh, he was like the French I mean, King. Was, right? They were they were renowned people. They Not were sure really. If, if he was Louis XV or uh, Louis XVI, right? I'm a historian, but I'm a historian focused on the, on the Pacific, right? So I'm not certain. But one of those kings, like when he was being uh, walked towards uh, his the guillotine, right? The French Revolution, man. Robespierre, like this guy, didn't <laughs> di di didn't care, right? <laughs> and he was being moved, and they said, "Okay, what's your last uh, wish?" And he said, "Well, I don't have a last wish, but I have a question. Uh, which one is that? Do you know anything about about our friend La Perouse?" French Revolution, 1789, and uh, La Perouse uh, came to this island in 1786, probably disappeared next year, 1787. Yeah, yeah. So two years later, there were no news about this guy in Europe, right? What happened to this guy? He probably vanished from planet Earth. Alien abduction, you say? Aliens, man. No, man. Probably. We don't know. Therefore, aliens. Therefore, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the default answer. Yes. The default <laughs> answer is aliens. If you don't know something, aliens are always the answer. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, again, as you said, this most of the captains were 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 like really renowned people. You know, James Cook. You know, navigators and. Uh, And La Perouse, Comte de La Perouse. But um, again, like the rest of the sailors are just random people, man. Like common era people, man. It's not. They, like, they didn't know how to write. They didn't Only know, the officers yeah, did. Yeah, definitely. I mean, these were not really reliable people in the sense of objectivity. So the that I, so I think that's that's the lack. That's the the problem with written historical records is that but there's a big lack of objectivity when it comes to, to, but, to but, the writings. But where do you expect objectivity, right? I mean, I'm not expecting it, so that... But, but from, from what kind of source do you expect objectivity? Well, again, from these records, you know, from, from probably nah, La Perouse, but it's not like I'm expecting them. I'm not saying that I expect objectivity from these people, but I, I don't doubt they don't have any. So yeah. I guess that's 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 they saw what they wanted to see. I mean, if you take a look at the records, some of these people in the same fucking boat, so two different, completely different islands. Even if they tried to be objective, they they were no, not. No, and, and and most people think you so, can be objective, but it's really hard not to be objective. But but here's this question, uh, Steve: uh, Do you find any value in the European records? Of course, of course I do. Yeah, definitely. all right. Of course I do. Now, most what, what, what's the value that you find on on the European records? Or, is that or the, it's the closest thing to something that we uh, of of a certain a third perspective from the outside the Rapa Nui realm. It's a perspective of the same place at the same people from an outside pers from a from a an outsider's perspective, right? Yeah. A third party from a third party, not just the Rapa Nui conception, but also you have now a third party that's that you, you know, that's taking a look at these people and writing down what they're seeing. 
So here's how I see this. Oral tradition is malleable. Yeah. It's completely malleable. Definitely, definitely. And we saw that the oral tradition being malleable as it is, it has its intrinsic value, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Because it's it's sourced from the, the same culture and from so the on inside out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So European records are not malleable. They're not. No, 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 uh, no, no. Because yeah, I mean to a certain extent, they might be malleable because uh, there are translations, there are transcriptions, and there could be slight changes, right? Yeah, but you can yeah, always yeah. return to the source, you can always return to the original, you can always yeah, go to the manuscript that's stored in some archive in Europe, right? And read it and compare it to the translation, and you will find out, ah, oh, this translation is crap because it was not well done or something. Yeah. But uh, it's not malleable in that sense because you have the original. The original is stored somewhere. It has been printed. Uh, I mean, it, it, it has, has been a physical form. It, it, it has, has been a physical form. And a digital form, too. It has been digitized. It's probably on archive.org. It's probably on, on whatever. It's, it's in, in, on, inter on the internet. Everywhere, right? It's obviously public domain. It's no longer copyrighted. It's been 300 years. I don't know. <laughs> I know the United States are crazy about copyright and sometimes things that are 150 years old are still copyrighted. But uh, somehow this thing is uh, it's not malleable. Right? Yeah. So it remains consistent. Yeah. It doesn't matter. A thousand years can pass, but you will be able to read a pristine version of Rogadine's account from 1722. You can read a pristine version of, um, I don't know, about um, Felipe González y Aedo in 1770. You can read a pristine account of and James Cook in 1774. Exactly, and so on, yeah. right? Yeah. So on, with all of them. So that's the good thing. What's the bad thing? European state for five, three, two days. Yeah. So what they saw was a snapshot. They didn't see the long-term version of the culture of the yeah. island. And it's also obviously culturally biased. They come from their own values, their own system, their, their own beliefs. And they see what they see, their own moral judgment. And whatever they see here on this island, they interpret from their own perspective, right? Don't which is not which is not necessarily something bad, but we have to filter that out. If we want to yeah. understand the culture of the island, we have to filter that out. And we have to understand, and well, obviously those accounts do not just only give insight about the Rapa Nui culture, they give insight about the European values, they give insight about the European beliefs about the island, the European beliefs about the Polynesians and so on, and how they had their moral judgments about the, the island and so on. So. I find a, a value on them, and we can rely on them as long as we are able to filter all the all bias. Things, yeah, definitely. Which, with oral tradition, is kind of like difficult to do. Sure. So, about the third way, because we have already covered oral tradition, we've covered uh, historical. European historical accounts, and we've we've not covered the third one. And the third one is obviously scientific scientific, scientific work. So about scientific work, what, what's your, what's, what, what do you believe about it? Well, science, well, the, man. Well, science, the, science. The good thing, the, the the good thing about science is that you don't have to believe it or not. It's not about belief systems. It's not about, I heard your feelings, I heard your, your way of thinking. I love your realism, man, because you know science has been under um, flack. I mean, it has been uh, yeah, attacked but, by, yeah, by but, 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 in but recent the, times, by postmodernism and, yeah, and, and idiotic I mean, philosophies. Li living that are living the, all the ideology behind, you know, sure. living just going to the concrete thing. That's the beauty about science. Sure. The beauty about science is that if it's not proven with facts, if it's not peer-reviewed, then it's not plausible and there's always the default position with science is always skepticism so that's good about it and that gives me a little certain um uh probably uh, a, a more uh concrete uh idea of what science really is now on the other hand the lack of it can also be the lack of scientific research the lack of peer reviewing the, the disparity and the polarization of ideas, ideology and politics, get it into science, that's a problem. 
I don't really see a problem with science itself. I see the the, the, the ideas behind it, the, the wills behind it, the people that do the research really, more than the research itself. Because you could totally bias yourself into believing something and then you can just prove it, you know, look for facts to prove your idea. And and the island, you can see that a lot. I guess that also contributes a lot of why people still believe that this is such a big mystery because there's no a scientific uh, valuation of this whole of the whole research on that is still very polarized can we agree that that science in in a as a concept is great but in practice there's good and bad science oh yeah definitely definitely of course and 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 also the good thing about science is it over time and especially at this time so especially in contemporary times we we do have a lot of of change in it a lot of technological advancement a lot of of, of skills getting in a lot of people getting into it and uh on that sense i'm 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 still very reluctant on on on, on the idea of keep doing scientific research as it is and uh um because we unless you're really sure about what you're doing you can fuck things up you know what i mean like like so how how do you evaluate uh, science applied to rapa nui in the last uh, well since science started when did science start to be um part of the rapa nui history? yeah i mean research on rapa nui well, scientific research I'll, on rapa nui i'll say maybe you know the first Glimpses of scientific research really were in the 1800s, like early, late 1800s, with Russian ships coming in and taking a look at it. You know, naturalist uh, kind of captains just taking a look at it. Now, the first ones was ob w the first publication ever was obviously Catherine Rutledge's, right? Like the 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 the, the not the oldest, I guess, but the, the more scientifically proper. And its in its manner was Catherine Rutledge's in, in, in 19 when she came here in 1914. 1914. All right, so uh, I see it a bit slightly different. I think that the first scientific work done on on Rapa Nui was the one done by uh, the Firsters, the Firsters, uh, Johann Reinhold Förster and uh, Georg Förster. So they came with James Cook in 1774. Obviously, their research is a bit flawed compared for modern standards. Oh yeah, definitely. and uh, their research is obviously tarnished by the fact that they only stayed here for a few days, so they couldn't stay yeah. for a bit longer to actually do proper research on the island. Uh, but they are the first ones that the first ones that suggest yeah, the, so, the so-called, yeah. and and this is really important because we're, we are going to start touching these um, subjects that are a bit itchy about the island, the collapse, right? You know that we have this uh, this author, popular author, Jared Diamond, that's considered by many a scholar. I disagree a bit. I know he teaches in the university, but he never did field work on Rapa Nui at all, but he wrote his book, Collapse. And based on uh, outdated research that was done until the 1970s, 1980s, uh, he considered that this island was a prime example of a society that collapsed internally. So a lot of it also comes, and lots of arguments and lots of um, information comes from uh, the firsters that came with James Cook. They were the first ones that thought that this island went through much better times in the past. But in 1774, the island was really in a bad situation due to the uh, things that the islanders did to their ecosystem, right? Deforestation, yeah, probably, yeah. or some natural disaster. They didn't know at all because obviously they stayed only for a few days. Yeah. But I think the first glimpse of scientific work was done in 1774. And obviously in the 1800s, we, you see much better work by the 1882 expedition of Wilhelm Geisler. And the 1882 expedition mm. of Bowery Clark, and 1886 expedition by Thompson, and uh, you know William J. Thompson was funded yeah. by the Smithsonian Institution, yeah, yeah. right? And obviously but, in the 20th century but, we have a lot. But a you lot also see, like on a, on a global 
discussion, you can see the science reputation, science being used as a more global way to understand the world, especially at the 18, late 1800s. I guess that's why you can see more of a a, a proper scientific fieldwork being done, although I guess most of them were naturalist. That's why I don't really consider that such a scientific work per se, uh, by scientific standards, even in the 1800s, but uh, but but still, like you know, I I see kind of like the glimpses. I understand what you're saying, and 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 I kind of agree and disagree at the same time because science wasn't really a a topic of study until you know probably. Dude, but Karl Popper and yeah, and, and before that yeah, you have yeah. uh, Bacon, uh, yeah, yeah, Roger Bacon, but, but it was and not from then as, onwards. But, but and think about it in the on the navigational in line. I mean, in the in the sense of the propagation of. Navy uh, of navigators throughout the South Pacific. Yeah, obviously these people that came in the 1700s and people that came in the early 1800s that stayed only for a few days, they cannot do proper scientific no. work. They cannot do anything like that. Obviously in the mm, late 1800s and early 20, uh, 20th century, uh, things changed a lot. They could take samples and later do the research back home when they moved to yeah, back to home. Europe or yeah. they moved back to wherever they went, right? Obviously that changes and, and, and science becomes a lot more... I don't know, it would be like saying, okay, 21st century science is the only one, 20th century science, Routledge, right? You said Routledge started it. Uh, well, we could oh, say that Routledge's methods were very primitive compared to the current methods. I, I mean, it would, I think it's, it's totally like the opposite. I, 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 don't I think, think we can say that. The 21st century methods are totally degenerated, and the 20th century methods were a lot more scientific in a certain extent, yeah, right? Yeah. But even though we have a lot more resources now, a lot more tools oh, now, yeah. and so on. But there, are, there were things in the 20th century, we will probably cover this in a different podcast about yeah, definitely. epistemology, but that the 20th century science, although a lot more limited by structural things, was a lot more objective. And science in the 20th, 21st century... It's more poli is political, do you say? Not sure if it's political, but it's market science. It, oh, yeah, it depends on market. It depends on high impact publications. I think it's very. I it, think it's very. It's very political right now. Like I think it's market. Market is what dr drives science nowadays. Yeah. If you want to get funding to do research, you need to publish a high impact study. Yeah. And what's a high impact one? One that denies everything that has been done before you. One that says everything you know about this is wrong. I'm going to show you the truth. Even though it's nonsense, not the truth, even yeah. though it's, it's, it's yeah. completely ridiculous and outrageous, that's the sort of study that gets the Google Scholar the high impact uh, ratings. That's the <laughs> one that gets the, the, I don't know, 400 references, so 400 citations. And then those kinds of studies are the ones that are made by bad archaeologists. Those are the sorts of studies that are done by bad anthropologists and the ones that get most of the publications and most of the funding to continue uh, like doing getting, flawed research. Yeah, yeah like a best-selling yeah. like best book, a best-selling research, a best-selling... So instead yeah. of searching for the truth, scientists are now trying to get funding and, that, yeah, and, and, and that's r really what drives their research. Okay, what can I publish that is going to get me funding and so on? Instead of, okay, I have to find out the truth and I have to publish the well, truth also, about this. Also, also need to think about the fact that most of the scientific research is focused on STEM sciences rather than, 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 than like STEM areas rather than anything else, like archaeology. There's very little funding in archaeology. There's very little funding in anthropology. I'm uh, not sure if there's little I mean, so funding. I mean, if you compare it to the funding that you have in engineering, in microbiology, in neuroscience... Ah, uh, because that's practical issues, yeah, practical yeah, stuff. Yeah, definitely. But, but the, I mean, the fact that science as a whole, it's, uh, it's really high regarded, doesn't mean that science as a whole is being developed in the same sorts of levels. No, 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 no obviously. No. In archaeology, is still interpretive. It's not one hundred percent. It's not an exact science. No, 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 you're, no. you're getting the data. You're getting the. the no, I mean, not even that. You know, all this controversy about the carbon datings and so on. Yeah, yeah. 
So basically, I mean, we still, basically, we still don't know what the fuck we're doing. Like in a, in a, in, a, in an easy way to put it, we still don't know what the fuck we're doing. Like, and and we're still trying to figure out what on a on on research level the, to maximize to to the efficiency of of the research as much as possible, because of fucks up with with the done in the past, right? So since we've done already the the three uh, well, ways to approach the past of the island, I mean it's it's basically that it's it's uh, oral tradition, it's historical historical facts. facts or records, historical records, not facts, yeah, yeah. historical records, yeah. and uh, scientific work. Yeah. Right. What which is more reliable than the other? What do you think? Well, what what um, I mean, I'm I, my opinion is that you. It are depends. obliged to use all three of them. It's yeah, impossible. Definitely. It's definitely. impossible to it, just it, use it, one again, of them. Again, like it all depends on the question that you're asking. Now, like let's say, for example, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the with the dumb example or with the extrapolated example. If somebody Tra- trying to make it not so dumb uh, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. for the audience. So, like for, for example, if somebody if there's a serious scientist that comes to the island and tries to. Um, to measure the amount of spiritual power that a rock has compared to the other, I'm going to say that guy is a fucking nut job. But if there's a guy that is asking about or using oral tradition about the, let's say, the social structure of the island, then yes, oral tradition can be very and utmostly uh, useful than any other area of research. So. It all depends on the questions that you're asking, right? It all depends on, on, on well, how but, you but tackle the problem. Not all of that is science, man. If someone says or someone comes to, to, to try to find a... I mean, I'm, a, not, I'm not looking if, if for someone, science per se. I'm looking for an answer if, per se. If someone comes here to try to test Deepak Chopra's kind of nonsense on oh, this yeah, island, right? That shit, I mean, like, yeah. uh, that's ridiculous, man. And obviously, that's not really science. No, you, you no cannot, that's pseudoscience. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you, you cannot blame science for that. No, no, no. You can blame human stupidity for that, but no, not really science. Right? Well, you can blame the lack of science on it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. because and, and, and obviously yeah, that the, the, the media, the, right? The media that, that obviously gives. Someone like Deepak Chopra or I mean, whatever, uh, right? I, I'm sorry, again, Deepak like, Chopra fans, but there you're not going to find any Deepak Chopra fans in these. Oh podcasts. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to 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 let you down, guys, but you know, like <laughs> the statues were not moved by aliens, man. Yeah. Like I just <laughs> want to take that out of the question. And right it was away, not you know? quantum physics, or it was not the consciousness of the Mayans that developed an idea in the Rapanui mines. It was not, there's no such thing as a as a magnetic field that unifies all these points and make this whole thing ravel. We should do an episode on pseudoscience. Uh, oh, that's gonna be a long. Yeah, that's gonna yeah. be either a very short one or a, a very, very long, long one. one. Yeah, 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 certainly. Yeah. So, what what do you think uh, that would be a very good example of to? I, I always like to do this, but I I'm guiding road scholar groups usually, yeah. right? And when I do the road scholar groups, I like to tell them about the three ways to approach the past of the island. So I use obviously always these three examples: the uh, oral, oral tradition, tradition, historical accounts, and scientific work. So I use always an example that's the settlement of the island, and how the settlement of the island is explained by either of these three, right? Yeah. So I don't know what what what. How can we explain this from oral tradition, settlement of the island? You know, you are oh, yeah, you. Yeah, how is yeah. oral tradition going on, Steve? Is, is yeah, it good? Uh, is it yeah, well, okay? It's, and... it's it can never always. The more the I mean, it depends. The more you know, the, the less more, you know. The more you know, the less you know. The more you hear, the less you know. Especially when it comes to oral tradition. So you pick and choose. You know, I guess with oral tradition, is always a thing of you pick and choose, like whatever suits you the best, right? Whatever story seems the most flamboyant one, it it seems to be a uh, uh, the level of of, of 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 how much knowledge you have in oral tradition. And even when you t- when you pick and which when you choose the one you want, then you 
add some more stuff. No, of course, on it, yeah, yeah. Right, you have course. to spice it up a little bit with your yeah, own. Definitely. I mean, uh, that's the whole. And it's part of it, right? That's it's, that's it's, that's the sense of oral. Tradition. The whole idea of the oral tradition is storytelling. Like that. It's, it's, storytelling. It's not about having it as a fixed thing. I'm I'm sure if you're great grand, if your great grandparents uh, see you telling your version of their tradition they would be incredibly proud man because yeah. it, they don't want it to be okay they, they are proud of their own version right but they know that you're entitled to tell tell your version of, of course it, yeah right? Yeah, and your definitely. version does not have to be exactly the same as theirs. No, 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 definitely. But uh, I mean, oral, oral tradition, and, and, and this is another thing. Oral tradition are not individual stories, right? Just to spell it out. It's n are not individual stories. Like, for example, let's say one of the oldest remnants, I guess, from oral tradition in Judeo Christian societies as a general thing is praying. It's praying, you know, it has. You know, you, you sure. do it as a, you know, it has a pace, it has a tone, it has a lyric. We do it all together. If you fuck it up, then, you know, someone Can to you? It's, it, it, they kind of force you to memorize that? Yeah, definitely. So it, that's, the self, that's, that's the self-corrective part of oral tradition. And that's but why I, a lot of people think that oral tradition is very reliable. But, but in really, really broad terms, not, not going into the, oh, there are so many different oral traditions and so on about this, but in the broadest possible terms, what does oral tradition tell us? About the origins of the, the arrival of, of the course, first, yeah. uh, or so the origins of the first Rapanui people. Go so ahead. essentially, um, the first population arrived from this mythical island called Hiva. Hiva is this island in the South Pacific that once uh, sprouted, then sunk. Haumaka, this let's say right hand of the king, back in Hiva gives has this dream when he gets out of his body and travels towards the east finding this island then he's he foresees this catastrophe and then he um, warns the population he warns the king and he complies all the people to move towards the east finding this island right so the first the first settlement was done by Hotumatua, this mythical figure, this mythical uh, vessel that arrived here uh, with uh, with the first population. So that's essentially it. Hiva, Haumaka, Hotumatua, and the rest of the population from this mythical island called Hiva that arrived here and once sunk by a natural catastrophe, right? Sure, sure. That's, uh, you know, not just to narrow down all the points, you know, the major points of it, right? So, for example, uh, that, that story, it's really remarkable because it gives us lots of clues, right? For example, the people came from the west. Yeah, definitely. They did not come from the east. Yeah, yeah because they traveled, he, Haumaka traveled towards the east. On of his, course, on towards the, the rising sun. sun right? Towards the rising sun on his dream, right? Yeah. So, yeah, definitely it shows, it points out towards a Polynesian settlement. Then we have um, another interesting thing is that the oral traditions that talk about the arrival of, like, all the details, right, that are uh, on it, they tell us the crops that they brought, right? Taro, yams, yams. banana, and uh, turmeric, arrowroot, squashes, gourds, and so on. And those are Polynesian crops, or uh, at least most of them. They talk about sweet potato, of course, that's the controversy, but we'll tackle that later in another podcast. And, uh, well, they tell us, like, most of the crops, almost all the crops were Polynesian, or they came from the West, yeah. not from South America. Right? Yeah. 99% of them. Right? Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, another interesting thing is that the oral tradition describes... Uh, the vessels, right? The yeah, kind of vessels they use, yeah. the double-hulled vessels, the catamaran, basically with uh, triangular, with triangular sails shapes, yeah. and, and, and so on. And you so, can even see the, 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 the influence of that in the, in the canoes built by the Rapa Nui, even though smaller in size, you can see the influence of it. Sure. Definitely. 
All right, so for example, historical accounts. What what do historical accounts, what can they tell us about the arrival of the first people, right? Or the first settlement of the Well, the, quest, the first question might be, do they even tackle that area, in a sense? Historical they, accounts? They don't try to. They, they might try to. And do you know what I find remarkable of these accounts is the following thing. There was a Spanish expedition that came here in 1770. They arrived yeah. in November of that year, mm -hmm. exactly for the Matariki festival of that year. It was really amazing because it was two ships with about 600 people yeah. overall. And um, the Santa well, Rosalia. They were Spanish, San Lorenzo and Santa Rosalia, and they arrived from Peru. They did not come directly from Spain. Obviously, the ships were built in Spain, but they came from Peru. That was yeah, their last yeah. stop. So they knew very well their Peruvian people. Mm -hmm. Do you know what they said about the people that lived on this island? They were look-alike. Did not look at all like the people oh, in wow. Peru. wow. They were completely different. different. And they looked like the Maoris. Yeah. So four years later, we happen to have this expedition that was British, the HMS Adventure and the HMS Resolution, led by Captain James Cook. Two days ago, or a few days ago, we uh, I don't know, if we did we celebrate that? The killing of Captain James Cook? Yeah, well, some SJWs did, totally. Yeah. The white man was killed by the colored people. All right, and uh, Captain Cook. Uh, came here in 1774 with his two ships, right? And among the crew members, there was this man from Rayatea. Rayatea, and he was able to communicate That's with it. his people. So what does that tell us about the first settlement of Rapa Nui? Well, they obviously knew they were poor Lincolns, I guess. Of course, so you have something. At least the people that were alive in the 1700s were Polynesians and there were no signs of any Peruvian people. So that, why do we get hired on later? Because he obviously completely distorted and misrepresented what the Spanish... Oh, does that ring a bell? Misrepresentation of uh, historical accounts? What? 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 Yeah. Oh no, I've never heard that. Sounds no. like the whole fake news uh, thing that's going on right now in the world. But anyways... Yeah. Guess what? It didn't start it today, man. No. <laughs> Alright, so then we are left with the last thing. Science. What does science say? Well, science obviously say the con the most con the, the biggest amount of evidence shows that in every different areas of scientific research that definitely were poems. Definitely. Sure. So no question, no. Let me tell you something that I'm going to present in the November conference uh, here on Rapa Nui. It's going to be a huge conference. It's the 10th international conference about East Island and the Pacific. And um, it deals with uh, all everything Rapa Nui, all things Rapa Nui, all things Polynesia. Uh, I attended the 8th conference that was done in Santa Rosa, California, Santa Rosa. Should we say Santa Rosa or should we say Santa Rosa, California? Well, I guess we should go for Santa Rosa. All right. And then uh, we had one in Berlin, Berlin, Germany, Deutschland, that was done in 2015. And I attended that one too. So we have uh, these two conferences that were really successful. Where every single scientist that's uh, devoted to Rapa Nui attended. I hope they come here to this island. Not sure how well organized it is. But I'm going to send my paper. And my paper deals with uh, this, right? About the colonization of the Pacific Islands. And not about the, the actual colonization, right? Not about the whole process, like from the. Uh, first human beings that migrated out of Africa 60,000, 65,000 years ago and all the way to Rapa Nui, right? But actually to the concept of credit, right? You get credit if you're an indigenous 
people. I don't want to sound like an SJW, but this is true. This is true. You get credit as an indigenous people if you find previously undiscovered uh, lands. You get credit for it. Yeah. So, for example, Lapita culture. Do they get credit for reaching Papua New Guinea? Do they get credit for reaching the Spice Islands? Do they get credit for reaching the Solomon Islands, where we have lots of evidence of uh, Lapita pottery over yeah, there? Definitely. These were Austronesian-speaking people, right, 5,000 years ago, that reached Papua New Guinea and reached Solomon Islands and the Bismarck Islands. Do they get credit for it? Not at all. Because those lands were previously uninha previously inhabited, right? They had people there already. Yeah. The Paleolithic, Melanesians, Papuans, people that lived there already. So there's obviously a cultural exchange and there's lots of cultural dynamics that go on on, on those areas, whatever. What do the Lapita people get culture, uh, uh, culture credit for? For the settlement of Vanuatu, New Caledonia, Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga. Because those lands were previously uninhabited. Yeah. Right? So, oh, they discovered those lands. They settled there for the first time. They introduced their crops. They introduced their domestic animals. And they introduced their uh, pottery and cultural traits to those islands. And they were the people that li lived there. Right? You know <coughs> that Tonga and Samoa were settled about... All right, let's say that they were already settled 2,800 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they had already a big population 2,800 years ago. But for the rest of the world, like for the image of the colonization of the Pacific, time froze for 1,500 years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, because the Lapitans kind of stayed there. They didn't move from Samoa and Tonga and so on. That's completely ridiculous. The Lapitans continued to navigate only back to the west, right? And they navigated and they found Tuvalu and they found Wallis and Futuna and they found lots of islands that are considered today Polynesian outliers like Tikopia, Anuta, Kapinga Marangi and so on. So they returned to the west. They just didn't continue to the east because they didn't find a need to go to the east and they wanted to consolidate the lands that they had settled already. So you have this double uh, navigation thing. So Lapitans or Austronesians, let's not call them Lapitans. There's a controversy about this. We will tackle it later in another podcast. But the Austronesians navigated back to uh, the west. And at the same time, Melanesians navigated to the east so there was this huge cultural dynamic and Melanesians became the predominant culture in Vanuatu and in New Caledonia and in Fiji, right? In Fiji, well, Fiji, New Caledonia are highly Polynesian influenced too. But, well, that's another thing. So there's no credit for that. 1,500 years of cultural dynamics in the South Pacific, no credit for it. Because those lands were already... Inhabited, already settled by other people, and they were within the sphere of settled settled bands and so on. So when do the descendants of the Lapitans, the descendants of the Austronesians, get credit again? When they started navigating towards the east again, from Samoa, Tonga, and Fiji, and they settled in Niue, about the 500 AD. And there's this quick colonization of the eastern Pacific, so Niue, Cook Islands, uh, Tahiti, Society Islands, then you have Southern Cooks, you have the Australs, you have Marquesas, you have uh, Gambier Islands, you have then people going north, Kiribati, and then you have these islands like uh, Necker, you have these islands like uh, Palmyra, Suwaro, and then you have Hawaii, and then you have people going still to the east, eastwards, and reaching Henderson, Pitcairn, and then people reaching uh, Rapa Nui and then people reaching South America and then other people going down to the southwest and reaching Aotearoa, New Zealand right so we get credit for Hawaii we get credit for Aotearoa we get credit for Central Polynesia we get credit for Easter Island Rapa Nui we get credit for all the islands in between do we Polynesians and I'm including myself because I'm a proud descendant of the Polynesian people both from Rapa Nui and from the Tuamotu Islands, right? Do we get credit for reaching South America? 
Mm. Not at all, because South America was previously settled. So who are the only ones that get credit for finding islands or places or continents that were previously settled? Europeans. Europeans. Right. So that's what I find unfair at all, right? What do you think about this, Steve? Well, following that train of thought, it is sound. It it does sound unfair. It does sound like it's it's. Uh, uh, I I will <laughs> I will comply to also the fact that it sounds also a little um, SJWish about the white man being being contemptuously uh, credited for all these findings, but, but it's this actually is based true. On fact. This, this is, is it's based fucking on truth, fact. man. Like yeah. Like, a lot of people still debate the fact that the Polynesians actually reached South America at some point. And somewhat, there's still debate on it. Nah, I don't... Uh, nah, really? Dude. There are still some people that deny the fact, Dude, man. Uh, yeah. Well, fake news Fake news, really dude. Come on, are you kidding me? <laughs> so, yeah. But do you like my paper that's gonna be presented? Dude, right? I love it, man. Like, I guess... It's Nobody about has, credit. Yeah, credit. it's about credit. I'm probably going to, you you know, all articles have this whole thing about um, naming the article. The title of the article has to be very pompous, like uh, whatever, like three words: uh, society, uh, development, and culture in uh, Eastern Polynesian uh, 12th century within the Vanuatu sphere. Right, something like that. Yeah. Whatever, whatever. I'm, I'm just making up something. Yeah, right? yeah, definitely. It's ridiculous, but anyway. But I'm just going to call this presentation credit. What do you think about that? I think it sounds cool, man. I think it sounds <laughs> fucking cool. You're gonna rock that thing out, man. You're gonna rock it out. Are well, you going gonna... to present something for the conference? What do you think? Um, me myself? Yeah. No, man. No. You're a linguist, man. You should present. Yeah, something. but like, I'm really not good with. With uh, um, I'm I'm not really good with other scientists. Try to find a, an excuse. Okay, I'm we we are listening. Well, first of all, I've never published anything on Who on cares Polynesian about world. This is and, the perfect just, time to do. It. Yeah, and and I'm just entering it. You know, I don't want to be all content, uh, all, all flamboyant on it, and and just go from nowhere to. To, oh, I published something and I presented it here. We've all and, done that at some yeah, point. But but you know you're more related you're more related to that world than I am right now. I'm just I you know I'm just the new kid on the block. I'm I'm not a I'm not. Can a, you sing one of those songs? Uh well, if you keep listening to the post to the podcast, probably you will. All right. But uh, not really no. So yeah, I'm just trying to lay it down. I'm just, you know, like uh, I want to present myself into one of these things just to see what's up, just to see how it's going, and uh, you know, get to know more people, and then enter it, and probably publish something. But not quite, not quite right now. But you're going to attend it anyway. Oh yeah, definitely. Of I'm course. going to attend it. Yeah. Sure, man. Yeah. So what do you think? Uh, I mean, how can we sum up the this first podcast? Do you think there's a do, or something you want to say, something you have stuck? Um, I think we covered pretty well a lot of stuff, you know. I think we covered pretty well the, the, the three main ideas of how to look back at the past and how do we use them in order to, to, to really understand what really happened or to have a glimpse of what really happened. And, uh, and I think it's a good basis for the rest of the podcasts. Yeah, you know, sure. I think it's a good, if you, if, I think it's a good uh, way to start. So I, I, like I, I feel pretty good because this was to totally scriptless, one take, no edition, and, and uh, it, yeah. it, I hope it, it, you enjoyed it, guys, and uh, well, stay tuned because it's going to be updated every week, so yeah. you don't want to miss what, what comes next. If you're interested about Rapa Nui and about the Pacific, uh, well, keep listening. This one was really an introduction, but we are going to do a lot more. We're going to cover specific stuff later, so uh, yeah, stay tuned. All right, it was a pleasure, guys.